everybody. With Bob Christopher and Richard Pfeiffer, I'm Bob Davis, and this is Basic Gospel, a media ministry dedicated to helping you hear, believe, and live the good news of Jesus Christ. Today we continue in our study through the Simple Gospel Simply Grace Study Guide. We'll be picking up with Chapter 6, the uh, chapter entitled, It Is Finished, page 41. And with a quick reminder that the phone lines are not open today, we'll get underway with our study. Here is Bob Christopher. Well, thanks, Bob. This is just great news, this uh, pa- this chapter on It Is Finished. Uh, Jesus said those three words, uh, final three words from the cross, mm-hmm. It Is Finished. It was a victory cry, and it means victory for you and me as far as forgiveness of sins is concerned. And so we really want to uh, dig deep into this subject, uh, spend adequate time uh, really laying the foundation, the groundwork for what it means uh, to have forgiveness of sins and exactly what Jesus Christ accomplished for us through his death on the cross. Uh, I read a book in, in researching, uh, you know, in, in preparation to write this particular book. It was called Free of Charge uh, by a professor at Yale University, and he wrote this, God is the God who forgives. And that's what we long for in life. We know that we need forgiveness of sins. We know that we're sinners. Uh, that's just intuitive knowledge. We don't have to be convinced of that. What we need to be convinced of is the fact that God understands, knows our need, and has sent Jesus to take care of that problem, to actually forgive us of our sins. So that's that's good news. So we want to uh, start this particular chapter with a couple of questions. Do you know that God has forgiven your sins? If not, do you long to know God's forgiveness? Do you want to experience rest and peace and assurance? Well, all of those questions are answered in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel proclaims to you that you can know and experience God's forgiveness. And boy, is that great news. Boy, is that ever hope for the hopeless. Mm -hmm. Boy, is that ever a cold glass of water on a hot Texas day. (laughs) Uh, I mean, that's the refreshment our souls need. Uh, Just that assurance, that confidence that we can have forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Now, if we're going to know anything about forgiveness, we have to go to the cross. We have to take a look uh, right there and see what forgiveness is all about. And, uh, you know, one of the things that Jesus said before he went to the cross is he gathered his disciples. Uh, He said, uh, you know, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. So when Jesus laid down his life for you and me, what motivated him to do so? Well, it was his love. Uh, It was his love for you and me that motivated him to lay down his life. Why? Because his love wanted us to have and to experience and to walk in forgiveness of sins. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And uh, it's, it's just a powerful, powerful truth. Uh, There's lots of critics, lots of skeptics, uh, lots of agnostics that don't understand that sacrificial type of love. Uh, But that's what it took in order for us to be forgiven. And we're really going to learn a lot about that in in this particular chapter. So it is finished. As we uh, as we move on, let me just make some observations about forgiveness of sins, uh, guys. We've been at this a long time, haven't we? Uh, as far as ministry, as far as radio is concerned, all throughout our history as a ministry, uh, forgiveness of sins has topped the list as far as issues that have been discussed. Uh, it, it's it's one of those things that keeps people up at night that ties their stomach in knots if if they're unsure of what Christ has accomplished for them at the cross. So in all of our ministry experience, here are three observations. All Christians know that Christ died to forgive their sins. I mean, you can ask anybody in in the world, anywhere around the world, why did Christ die? And the answer will come back to forgive sins. So they know, they've made the connection that Christ's death on the cross was there to bring about forgiveness of sins. Two, second observation. 
even with the clear declaration of God's word that our sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven through the finished work of Jesus Christ, Christians still struggle with fear and guilt. They wonder whether they've been forgiven or not. Mm -hmm. So the gospel speaks a very clear message. Uh, There's no confusion in the words of the gospel. Jesus died for our sins. It doesn't get any clearer than that. And we know in dying for our sins that forgiveness is available to us. And I think that's where we make the disconnect, or that's where the disconnect is. Uh, We don't know that in Christ, that forgiveness that he provided is now ours. So in not knowing, we struggle with fear and guilt. We live on the edge of doubt, wondering if God has forgiven us or not. Then the third observation, as far as forgiveness is, is concerned, is this. Confusion on this most fundamental truth hampers every other aspect of the Christian life. So if you haven't settled this issue, haven't come to grips with the fact that your sins, not just some of them, all of them, have been forgiven through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, then you're going to struggle in your Christian life. Absolutely. You're going to feel like your, your growth has been stymied, that you're stuck in the mud, that you're, you, you, know, you don't see any fruit, so to speak. Um, you feel more and more like God is distant from you instead of close at hand. Uh, those are all the things are, that you're going to experience as a result of not knowing that your sins have been forgiven once and for all. So this is an important topic, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, this is this is one of those life changers, game changers. It really does change everything as far as your relationship with Christ is concerned. So let's ask this question, why the cross? Why did God have to do it this way? Why did Jesus have to suffer uh, such a painful, agonizing death at the hands of the Romans? Why did he have to die this way? Well, it is and was a very puzzling question, and but with the right perspective, we certainly are going to get a very clear answer. So we're going to look at a couple of passages. The first one is in Matthew chapter 16. And this is one of those seminal passages, I think, in the New Testament. The most compelling question that has ever been asked was asked by Jesus and was recorded in this particular story. So Jesus is with his disciples at at Caesarea uh, Philippi. So it's up in northern Israel. It's near the headwaters of the Jordan River, the beginning point. And, And I think that's significant because... This question that Jesus asked is really the beginning point as far as our relationship with God is concerned. So at that particular point in time, Jesus' teaching and his miracles were causing quite a stir, stir in Israel. So folks were asking, they were talking, they were speculating, could this be, could this Jesus of Nazareth be the Messiah? Could he be the anointed one? And so Jesus took his disciples up and he asked them this question, what are people saying about me? And these, these men had, you know, had their ears tuned to what was going on. They were listening to the banter that was, that was taking place at that time. And so they said, well, some think you're a prophet. Some think you're this. Some think you're a great teacher. Uh, these are the things that people are saying. And then Jesus turned the question on them, and he said, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter stood up and confidently delivered the answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to, the, said to Peter, you, you are right. And this information came to you by revelation. Yes. This wasn't something that you just came to on your own, by your own uh, analysis, uh, by your own um, intellectual skills or anything like that, your own uh, logical um, explanation. This came from God the Father direct to you. This is truth that can only be known by revelation. 
And so Jesus said, upon this confession that Christ is, is the anointed one, the son of the living God, the church is going to be built. Yes. Uh, so that's the beginning point. Uh, that is how we enter into Christianity, uh, by confessing with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, making the same confession that Peter did. Well, after that, Jesus goes on to explain his mission. And so he says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So there was this revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, And now Jesus was going to tell his disciples and did tell his disciples as the the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God, here's what I've come to do. And he tells them he's going to be handed over to the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He's going to be killed. And on the third day, he's going to be raised to life. It's very clear, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not what they wanted to hear. It's not, I mean, put yourself in their shoes. Here's this guy with the, the miracles and the power. It's clear he's something special. And when, when Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and Jesus said, you're absolutely right, they all went, yes, it's, it's about to change. And then Jesus told them this. He's going he's, he's gonna to be killed. <laughs> he's going to be that's killed. Not, that's, you're <laughs> that doesn't exactly sound right. right. That's not what they wanted to hear, but that was his mission. Yeah. That's why he came, to be killed, mm-hmm. to die in our place, and then on the third day be raised to life. It seems like they kind of missed that part yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, it didn't make sense to them that he was going to be raised back to life. Um, so this is what he said. It was very clear, very plain, black and white. He didn't speak in parables when he explained his mission. He just laid it out there. This is what's going to happen. Well, Peter, the guy who stood up and confidently delivered that answer, he decided to talk to Jesus about this. So in verses 22 and 23, uh, Matthew records this, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. I mean, who in the world rebukes the Lord? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Jesus was being such a buzzkill right then. You, yes. you, you got to talk to him. Yeah. Well, I guess Peter is the guy who does yes. that, and we may do the same. <laughs> I don't know. So Peter said, never, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. In other words, I'm not going to allow no. you to fulfill your mission. You're not going to be handed over. You're not going to be killed, which means... He won't be raised from the dead. And Wouldn't that's, need to be. That's right. That's where our hope is, is in that resurrection. Yeah. Um, so he's preventing something. So Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Hmm. So just a few minutes earlier, uh, you've, you've received this incredible revelation from God the Father. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the only way you could have received it. And now you are voicing the very concerns of Satan. Uh, So he says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Oftentimes we miss the message of the cross because our perspective is from a human perspective instead of a godly perspective. We see it from an earthly viewpoint instead of a heavenly perspective viewpoint. So we don't get the reason Christ had to do what he had to do. Uh, I've, I've been fascinated over the last couple of years with a lot of the debates uh, that have been taking place between Christians and atheists. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Larry Taunton on our broadcast not long ago, and he's organized some of these debates, and he struck up a friendship with the most notorious of all the atheists, Christopher Hitchens. And one of the things Hitchens always said in the debates was the idea of Christ having to die for the rest of mankind just never made sense. It just boggled his mind. It seemed barbaric. It seemed just yucky and and brutal and grotesque and, and all of those sort of things. It just did not make sense. Why? 
because he was looking at it from a human perspective rather than a godly perspective. And if he had talked to Jesus just as Peter did, Jesus would have said to him, get get thee behind me, Satan, because yeah. you are seeing this not from a, from a godly concern, but merely a human concern. Yeah. So we need the right perspective to understand what this cross is all about. Absolutely. Well, friends, you're listening to the Friday Study Series. If you don't have your copy of Simple Gospel, Simply Grace, and its accompanying study guide, it's available at basicgospel.net slash teaching. Again, that's at basicgospel.net slash teaching. Also, we have a gift for you when you sign up for ministry emails. It's our free ebook called Forgiveness, the Door to Life. It's a powerful resource to set you on the path of joy and freedom in Christ Jesus. Get your copy today by clicking subscribe at basicgospel.net. Now again, here's Bob Christopher. Well, thanks, Bob. So why did Christ, Christ die? What is the godly perspective? What is the godly concern? I think if Peter had understood that, uh, he would have never addressed Jesus the way that he did. He would have never rebuked him. He said, I hate to see you be handed over. I'm going to cry and weep uh, just uncontrollably when I see you hang on that cross, uh, but I'm going to recognize it's for me, that you're standing in my place, that you have that, that you're in my shoes taking my punishment, the punishment that I justly deserved. I'm going to weep for, for your death, but I'm going to rejoice in the fact that three days later you're going to come back to life and forgiveness and life can be mine. But he didn't have that perspective. He didn't realize that he needed his sins to be taken care of, to be forgiven once and for all. So let's take a look at some passages and see what the godly perspective is. What is God's concern as far as the cross is concerned? And this passage that we're going to read, Hebrews 9, 22, is one of those passages that you need to star, you need to underline, you need to memorize, you need to really build this into your the- theology as a premise, um, an unchangeable, unmovable, non-negotiable premise. And here's what the passage says. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So what's necessary for forgiveness to take place according to this passage? Shedding of blood. And that was true in the Old Covenant as well. Uh, It was a blood covenant, wasn't it? As far as that old covenant was concerned, they had to offer the blood of bulls and goats. And when they did, in exchange for that, uh, as they put that on the mercy seat and then put that on the scapegoat, they could experience a temporary sense of forgiveness. Yes. Uh, But those sacrifices were really only shadows of the reality that was going to happen in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So when Moses made the covenant, when they signed the deal, so to speak, um, they put it into effect with blood, didn't they? Yeah. And and notice how important that was. If if God hadn't used the animal sacrifices pointing forward to Jesus in order for Israel to have received forgiveness, when you sinned, you would have had to die. I mean, that, that was God's right to kill us because... He is God. He created us perfect. He set everything up to be perfect, and we rebelled. But he loved us so much that he set up this sacrifice. And and we didn't have to appease an angry God. He loved us so much that he initiated this to us. But still, without this blood, there would be no forgiveness. It's a key point. Let's let's repeat that. Uh, If it's worth saying once and it's a good point, we need to say it again. We do not have to appease an angry God. No, we don't. God's love sent Jesus. Yes. That's what this is all about. There's no greater love than this that someone lay down his life for a friend. That's exactly what Jesus did. God initiated all of this good news, and we simply benefit from what God in Christ has done on our behalf. God considered us friends. Absolutely. And he said, <laughs> he laid down his life for us. Wow. That's just mind boggling, isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. And it is our heart's desire. It is our prayer that that love become real in your heart. 
that it's not just something that you give lip service to, but that you actually know that God loves you. I know in my life, uh, you know, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, I under I, I memorized that verse. I knew it. I could oh, quote yeah. I could quote it. And I would say, Well, yeah, God loves the world. He has to. He's God. But what about me? I wasn't so sure yeah. with the me part. Uh, because I had a law mindset. I thought his love needed to be earned, that I had to do something to get into God's good graces. But that's not how God approaches us. That's not a godly mindset. That's a human perspective. A godly mindset is a mindset of grace. God just simply initiating because he loves us. No strings attached, nothing to for us to do, only to receive. And that's what this is This is all about. So God sent Jesus to shed his blood so that we could have forgiveness of sin. So why the cross? Because shedding of blood was necessary yes. in order for us to be forgiven. Without it, there is no forgiveness. We can plead. We can beg. We can promise. We can double down on efforts. We can go to church. We can help the poor. We can do all of those sort of things, but not one of them, not one will bring about forgiveness of sins. No. Only blood. That's the only thing that God would accept. And Jesus willingly shed his blood for you and me so that we could be forgiven. Talk about good news. And we have to come to grips with the fact that his blood was enough. There's nothing more that needs to be done. God was fully satisfied with the work of Jesus on our behalf. So without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So let's ask a question. How many times did Jesus shed his blood? Once. One time. So... That one shedding of blood by Jesus was sufficient to take away all of our sins, Mm -hmm. not just some of them. Well, let's ask this question. If Jesus only died for our sins up to the time that we received Christ, Mm -hmm. what would have to happen if we needed more forgiveness? He'd have to die again. He would have to die again. Is he going to do that? No. Absolutely not. So what do we have to conclude about this one sacrifice that he made 2,000 years ago? That it was sufficient to take away all of our sins to the point that we can stand before him and say, we are forgiven people. In Hebrews 10, 7, the writer says, Then I said, Here I am, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Why did Jesus come? To do the will of his Father. What was the will of his Father? For Jesus to shed his blood once and for all so that you could be forgiven. It's done, folks. It is finished. This is just the tip of the iceberg. We'll pick up next week and dive even deeper into this finished work of Christ and what it means to you on a personal day-by-day basis. You mean it gets even deeper? It does. It gets even deeper. It gets even deeper better. That's why they call this good news, folks. That is real good news. Hope you've enjoyed the study, everybody. We're glad you joined us for the study edition of Basic Gospel. Keep in mind that the Simple Gospel Simply Grace book and study guide are available at basicgospel.net slash teaching. That's basicgospel.net slash teaching. And a reminder, too, that Basic Gospel needs your help to keep the good news on the air, to keep it coming. We ask you to join us today by clicking donate on our website, basicgospel.net. There's a basic, there's a basic gospel donut, uh, uh, donut donate link on every page at the website. Again, that's donate at basicgospel.net. Picking up your, your habits, Bob. <laughs> Thanks again for being with us, everybody. Now for Bob Christopher, for Richard Pfeiffer, and the Basic Gospel Ministry team, I'm Bob Davis, wishing you a wonderful weekend in and because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be back for a live edition on Monday. I hope you'll join us then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.